so hello everyone welcome to the session uh, thanks for joining in in such a large number so i am karishma and i'm accompanied by my colleague sunil kumar uh, from taxman's indirect tax uh, research and advisory team so before starting the session uh, i would like to brief you about the agenda of our uh, session so i will uh, we will be discussing about uh, the concept of its establishment under the indian gst uh, our session will be uh, followed by uh, another presentation by mr gayardo uh, mr gayardo is a tax auditor since uh, 1996 uh, and he has been working as tax director in finance ministry as vat deputy director he is responsible for vat policy matters uh, he was a partner in kpmg from 2011 uh, till 2016 and back in the tax administration from 2017 so uh, before starting the session uh, here is here are the few tips for the attendees so your mic will be off uh, throughout the session but you can post your questions in the chat box given on the right hand side so uh, your questions will be answered by us at the end of the session and after the session we will be giving you the uh, presentation yeah so before directly jumping on to the meaning of the term fixed establishment we would like to create a background of the concept background of the concept for this we have uh, pro uh, we will be providing you uh, illustration Uh, so in this illustration of cross border transaction between the spanish company and an indian company the spanish company entered into a contract with the indian company which is a limited established in new delhi so generally these contracts are uh, peculiar in nature so these are generally uh, followed by maintenance contract so in the given case uh, let's suppose uh, the spanish company um under the maintenance contract requires the av availability of its resources at new delhi so for for this purpose the spanish company uh, outsourced the whole contract to an indian company that is uh, o limited um that is o limited uh, which is established in new delhi so along with this uh, it deputes its uh, supervisors in new delhi so if we look at the whole transaction uh, so uh, the contract is actually performed by o limited which is in new delhi and uh, that is on behalf of the spanish company so for this arrangement uh, we would like to put forth few questions before you uh, which are the first is whether a limited that is the recipient in our case is liable to pay gst under the reverse charge or alternatively whether the company the spanish company which is uh, uh, whether the spanish company is actually required to take registration in india and accordingly pay taxes under the forward charge so since these two cases are uh, mutually exclusive so the type of tax to be discharged under each case would uh, differ so uh, that is because in the first case uh, if a limited pays tax under uh, reverse charge that is because of because the transaction qualifies as the import of services so it will be discharging igst whereas if spanish company takes registration in india it will have to discharge cgst and sgst uh, now another interesting question which comes out of this whole transaction is Uh, whether the services provided by o limited to the spanish company would qualify as export of services or not so in this regard uh, let us understand a few uh, requirements and definitions which are given under the gst law uh, so the first is import of services which will be important in the context of transaction done by uh, a limited so the definition of import of services required uh location of supplier to be outside india location of recipient should be in india the place of supplier of services should be in india whereas the export of services uh, which will be important uh, for o limited the definition requires that the location of supplier must be in india the location of recipient must be outside india 
and place of supply should be outside India. With these other two requirements, which are actually not relevant for uh, this discussion. So moving on to the next part is registration under the GST. So the supplier would be required to take registration in the state from where the supply is actually made. And the finally, the final point is the type of tax to be discharged. So in this, in this case, uh, two factors are really important. That is location of supplier and the place of supply. If both of these falls into the same state, it would qualify as intrastate supply. Whereas if these two falls under the different states, then the transaction would qualify interstate supply. Uh, so these four points would be very important if we look at uh, if we look at the GST implications for cross-border transaction. However, for the domestic supply, only third and fourth point would be relevant. So what is common under all these four points is uh, it is uh, what is the location of supply uh, from where the location of supply is made and from where the location uh, the location from where the supply is received. So this uh, from now onwards, Sunil sir will take. Thank you, Karishma, for uh, creating a nice background on this concept of fixed establishment. Uh, what we understood uh, from uh, till now is that the in all these four uh, scenarios or the definition or the maybe the requirements under the GST law, it is very important for us to understand the location from where you make the supply or the location where you receive the supply, right? Uh, basis this your transaction would be uh, qualified as an import of services or maybe an export of services registration requirement would be triggered accordingly and the type of tax that you need to pay on the transaction would also depend uh, uh, on this uh, definition on this particular term now the law defines the location of supplier or recipient uh, 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 in four parts the first part of the definition says that where you have a place of business for which you have obtained the registration under the GST law. In that case, the location of supplier or the recipient as the case may be supplied from the supplier's perspective. And if you are claiming the credit, then it is important from the recipient's perspective. Right. So if you have taken the registration, then that place uh, for which you have taken the registration would be qualified or would be called as the location of supplier or recipient. The another uh, uh, part of this definition is the second link of this definition is about the fixed establishment, which is the subject matter of our discussion, right? Uh, if a place qualifies as a fixed establishment, then the location of supplier from billing perspective or the location of recipient for claiming the credit perspective would be the fixed establishment person. Now, the third limb of this definition provides that where you are providing services from more than one location or you are receiving services uh, at more than one location. Suppose you have a multi-state operations and you are providing uh, services from uh, various locations. So in that case, what would be the location of supplier or receiver? So law provides that the location of the establishment, which can either be your the place of business as per first link or the fixed establishment as per the second link. So location of the establishment most directly concerned would be called as the location of supplier or receipt. Uh, the residuary clause provides that if you are not able to determine as per the above three limbs of the definition, then the usual place of residence would be called as location of supplier or receipt. Now, so how we can determine that whether uh, which establishment is basically the most directly concerned. So suppose you have a, a contract whereby you are providing services uh, from multiple states. So how you would determine which of the establishment is most directly concerned? See, if you have taken a registration, then there would be no issues. But if you have not taken a registration and that place qualifies as a fixed establishment, and in that case, you would suppose uh, you would require to have a registration in that state. So this becomes very important to understand that whether a place from where you are making a supply qualifies a fixed establishment or not, and is it uh, uh, directly concerned with the services or not. So uh, 
uh, under the erstwhile service tax regime there was a similar definition of fixed establishment where the cbic has provided certain indicative factors which enables us to uh, determine uh, that which of the establishment is most directly concerned uh, when it comes to the definition of the location of supplier or location of receiver the uh, clarification provides that it could depend upon the contract between the service provider and service receiver where there is no contract you have to see the documentation the correspondence email etc between the parties and that will determine uh, the most directly concerned uh, establishment the place from where you are actually providing the services from supplier's perspective and the place where you actually consuming the services effectively using the services would be called as a location of recipient sorry the most directly concerned establishment uh you need to see whose staff is actually involved suppose you have a staff uh, in different location uh, you have entered a contract with the ho but actually the staff of the particular unit is involved in provision of services so that staff would be called as a most directly concerned and accordingly billing would required to be done from that particular um, uh, establishment not from the ho right okay and how you basically perform the agreements is again another indicative factor so with this background let us come on to the definition of fixed establishment the law defines fixed establishment in exhaustive manner it provides the fixed establishment is a place which is uh, other than the registered place of business which is characterized by a sufficient degree of permanence and suitable structure in terms of human and technical resources for uh, providing these services or in context of receiving for receiving or using these services for its own needs so this definition has few uh, components we'll discuss each of these components separately first is a very easy part that it's a place other than a registered place of business so uh, this place uh, the fixed establishment uh, cannot be called as a place where you have taken a registration that would come under the first limb of the definition right the second uh, component of this definition is this place must have a sufficient degree of permanence the definition is not providing that there needs to be a permanence it says there needs to be a sufficient degree of permanence what is sufficient what is permanence is neither defined under the gst law nor it has been clarified by the cbic it needs to be checked on the facts of each case whether there is a sufficient degree of permanence or not so let us have some brainstorming uh, the example which we have discussed uh, the background of the transaction so the spanish company has deputed its supervisors uh, at uh, o limited premises for providing services to a limited in india in that case uh, uh, the contract provides that the supervisors or etc employees would be there for the entire tenure of the contract so if the service provider is uh, deputing its employees at a particular location for the entire tenure of the contract can we say that there is a sufficient degree of permanence in our view we can say works contract suppose you are having a civil contract uh, basically in other state whereby you are sending your equipment labor etc from this place of business to the other state so the other state where you basically executing the contract will that be uh, uh, qualify within this expression sufficient degree of permanence uh, i think uh, in our view it would not qualify because there is no permanence per se you would execute the contract and would come back to your place event company suppose uh, there is an event company who is organizing an event in a different state uh, that is a state other than the registered in which it is uh, basically registered will that state where the event is basically organized for 2 3 days uh, can you say that it would be getting covered within this expression sufficient degree of permanence again there is no permanence per se it is just providing the event and after performing the event will come back to its uh, home state right okay project office in india so uh, after taking the necessary approvals from rbi you 
basically opens a project office in india in performing certain apc contract etc so the employees uh, uh, the resources that you need technical as well as human resources they all exist uh, at this particular office so uh, this place generally called as a uh, uh, there is a permanent for that particular foreign company so the project office uh, in context of project office we can say that there is a sufficient degree of permanence is there the third component of this definition is there needs to be a suitable structure very important there needs to be a suitable structure in terms of human and technical resources right so two parts are there human resources and technical resources see the number of staff is not important how many number of staff you have employed at particular place would not be relevant as far as this particular last component of this definition as what is important is the adequacy of the arrangement uh, in order to carry out that particular activity which you are performing under the contract if there is an adequacy of the arrangement in terms of human and technical resources which through which you can provide your services to your customer your client in that case uh, it can be said that then uh, uh, this would cover within this particular uh, part of the definition of fixed establishment let us have some brainstorming on this part of the definition hmc comp hms companies so there is an hotel management company whereby it deploys or deputes its employees at a particular hotel whereby the managers etc basically manage the hotels so can we say that uh, hms company is basically having the uh, sufficient suitable structure in terms of human and technical resources mm -hmm. at the place of hotel uh, it would not uh, be a suitable structure because in these contracts generally the contract is uh, uh, managed by the ho or other place not at the hotel so that particular place cannot uh, be covered within this last expression right license office so license office in india is basically to do the licensing activity mere so there is no human and technical resources in india therefore we cannot say that there exists a suitable structure in terms of human and technical resources project office as we discussed in the last part uh, the employees who perform the contract is basically uh, 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 depute at the project office from where they make a supply so in this case we can say that yes there is a suitable structure in terms of the human and technical resources now this definition says there needs to be a human and technical resources what if uh i am using the client's equipment for providing the services so this generally uh, happens in engineering uh, consulting contracts whereby uh, the engineers uh, comes from outside india and they use the equipments of the client itself in order to provide the training in order to provide the service to the employees of this indian company so can we say that if we are using the equipments of third party will that again be covered within this expression right and there is one more uh, uh, question if i have outsourced this contract to third party and human are pretend is third party will that again be covered in this definition these are some open points uh, which are uh, not uh, much been clarified by the cbic nor by the uh, they, we don't have uh, the judicial aspect of it also right renting of property uh, so suppose you have a uh, 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 involved property in different uh, states but you are managing these properties from uh, ho say in haryana right so will you say that uh, you would have to take a registration in the each of these states because this qualifies as a fixed establishment uh, the answer would be no because if you are managing these properties from the ho then there exists no human and technical resources uh, uh, at a particular in uh, the location of the particular uh, property therefore it's not getting satisfied the last criteria of the definition of fixed establishment and thus it would not be qualified as a fixed establishment so cbic uh, uh, under the earth well service tax regime through uh, uh, education guide has clarified this definition uh, few clarificatory points are provided by the cbic these are it says that the arrangement at a fixed establishment must be capable of executing the task task under the contract 
if it is not able to uh, uh, do the task or execute the task then it would not satisfy the last criteria of the definition that is suitable structure of human and technical resources if there is a temporary presence of a staff by way of a short visit at a client place then there is no uh, permanence suitable structure of permanence uh, sufficient degree of permanence therefore again it would not qualify as a fixed establishment just take an example of an internal audit services you are providing services to your client you are deputing your employees team members at client space for a period of say one month so this is a temporary presence of a staff at a client visit so your client place would not be uh, called as a fixed establishment because there is no sufficient degree of permanence there and obviously the second criteria is also not getting satisfied in this case <clears throat> if a overseas business set up his office this is basically an example of project office sets up an office in india and providing services from that particular office then obviously that qualifies a fixed establishment this is an example of immobile property which we have just discussed if you have a uh, this is basically in respect of cross border transactions suppose a foreign person or entity has a immobile property in india so cbic clarification says that place of immobile property would not qualify as a immobile property sorry uh, the fixed establishment because in that case there is though there is a permanence of the establishment but there is no suitable structure in terms of human and technical resources however if a company the foreign company set up an office in india for managing these property then that place would qualify as a fixed establishment because in that case it would uh, satisfy the other criteria uh, the last criteria of the definition and this is very important part uh, so we have seen the definition of fixed establishment the requirement uh, which just the karishma has explained to you the four requirement export import registration requirement and the type of tax that you have to pay if we are not complying with the fe requirement then what would be the consequences so these consequences are implications in the hand of supplier if the supplier has not taken the registration uh, at a place which qualifies as a fixed establishment but he has discharged the tax i'm talking about the domestic transaction but he has discharged the tax from other place say ho right in that case the department may demand tax under correct head in fc state because you are providing services from that state not from the ho right though the tax which you have paid from the ho uh, 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 place that you can claim the adjustment or the refund as the case may be because that is something called as a deposit not the tax because there was no levy of tax in that case there is one more interesting point uh, the gst law provides two sections section 77 of cgst act and section 19 of the igst act where it provides that if a registered person is has paid basically a tax under the wrong head then he can claim the tax he has paid under the wrong head and in that case the tax the accurate tax which he going to pay in that case he is not required to pay any interest in our view if you have not taken the registration and fe place these sections would not be applicable for you why so because this section is applicable for the registered persons not uh, in general for everyone or you can say the taxable person it applies for the registered person one so therefore the interest immunity may not be available to you department may demand interest if they are demanding uh, the tax from the fe place implications in the hands of recipient suppose the supplier discharges a tax under the wrong head can department uh, challenge the claim of the itc of the recipient because he has paid the tax under the wrong head instead of igst he has paid say cgst sgst in that case uh, our view is that department though uh, uh, may dispute this itc but the risk of denial is very low because uh, the determination of the correct tax liability is the responsibility of the supplier and recipient cannot be held liable for the payment or uh, the, the reversal suppose you have claimed the credit at wrong location uh, instead of receiving the invoice at the location of recipient of services which may be an fe uh, you have claimed at other place so can department deny your credit in our view yes this is a very well argument uh, uh, from the department side they can challenge your itc because 
one of the condition for claiming the itc is that you must receive the services so if you have received a services at a particular location which qualifies as a fixed establishment or other registered place of business then that registered person can only claim the credit the other registered person can claim the credit the last point is uh, under the cross border transaction the uh, igst paid under reverse charge suppose you have paid the igst under the reverse charge but uh, later on it uh, 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 later on it found that the fe is liable to get registered under the india so fe was supposed to pay tax under the forward charge so can department uh, challenge your itc which you have claimed department again can challenge the itc which you have claimed arguing that the tax the amount which you have paid is just a deposit it's not a tax per se therefore you cannot claim the credit the tax which you have paid uh, go and apply for the refund right so this can again be argued just quick discussion on the relevant advance ruling still date on these issues so the west bengal advance ruling authority held that if there is a contract for 17 years uh, the maintenance contract whereby you have deputed your resources human and technical resources for that 17 years at a particular place which is the client place in this case uh, then you can say that there exists a sufficient degree of permanence second case the caterers uh, issue uh, you may see generally uh, the corporates uh, basically engage uh, engages the caterers uh, in their factory in order to provide food to their employees so if a caterer is basically maintaining the kitchen he is uh, uh, procuring the raw material and uh, storing it there preparing the food there and supplying it to the in, uh, employees there so uh, karnataka authority of advance ruling held that that place would qualify as a fixed establishment and accordingly you will have to take a registration in that state cross border consulting services in this case it was held that uh, the odisha uh, ar held that if the experts are coming into india and providing the technical services uh, it directly concluded that it exists there exists a suitable structure in terms of human technical resources and therefore in this context the uh, foreign company japanese company would require registration in india and accordingly to pay gst under forward charge works contract services we discussed about the civil contracts whereby you are performing contracts in other states uh uh, uh the karnataka as well as the rajasthan authority of advance ruling held that in that case you are not supposed to take any registration in the other states with this uh, i am handing over this session to mr uh, gyardo uh, <coughs> uh, to discuss with the eu part just give me a second okay so i will start i think that you're seeing me and you're hearing me properly and i would like to start by saying thank you for this opportunity this is a tremendous honor for me and a privilege so i really appreciate it thank you very much to taxman and thank you very much to mr kumar and karishma for the, the opportunity you give me to share some <coughs> thoughts on the european vat on the fixed establishments and the uh, the in, their impact on on vat i would like to start i'm trying to move ahead with some previous remarks thank you thank you very much and the previous remarks is that there is no european vat we have the spanish vat we have the french vat we have the italian vat or we have the german vat but there is no european vat what we have instead of this is an amortization rules i mean we have a directive the vat directive which is a very detailed one is a directive with more than 400 articles so it's an important directive and the member states of the european union including spain i'm spanish uh, obviously we have to follow the content of the directive okay instead when we don't follow the content of the directive and uh, there is european court of justice uh, remembering the european uh, states european tax administrations the relevance of the directive and the need to really respect uh, its content okay so this is the, the this is the point the member states have to follow the directive the directive sometimes 
is very clear and it establishes uh, a very clear treatment of the transactions, uh, but some other times is not that clear. Okay, so we have a, a, a background, legal background that maybe is not the same like in India or like in other places in which the legal provisions are somehow more easier to, to or easier to to manage with. Okay, the European Union in this case is 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 different. The case law of the European Court of Justice is basic. It's a basic piece in this in this mechanism because. And uh, the European Court of Justice is the European institution in charge of uh, understanding and selling uh, the proper understanding of the European directive, okay? So the European Court of Justice is selling, is telling the European member states how to understand, how to apply, uh, how and how to transpose uh, the European VAT directive. As, uh, in the same way as the, rate, the rest of the European provisions. So the relevance of the outcomes or the judgments of the European Court of Justice is this. This is the correct and specific understanding and interpretation of the European directive. And in the national courts, I work uh, nowadays in a national court, in the national courts, we have to follow the understandings and the criteria of the European Court of Justice. So this is the reason of uh, of, his relevance, of his relevance. Okay. On top of the directive, we have an implementing regulation. This is the regulation quoted in the on the bottom of the slide, and this uh, regulation uh, establishes with uh, more in a more detailed way the way in which we have to understand. Uh, some of the parts of the directive. So the, we have a legal background that somehow is difficult, uh, but is the legal background we have in VAT, which is the correspondent to GST in India, and the VAT we have in the European Union, which is more or less, in the, in the, at, the end of the day, at the end of the day, is more or less the same. What are the consequences of the existence of a fixed establishment in the European Union, in particular in Spain or in Italy or in Germany, or in France or wherever. Well, there are three main consequences of the existence of the firm of a fixed establishment. The first one is related to the place of supply of transactions. Okay, so mainly when we deal with supplies of services or with provisions of services, the destination principle is the general one. Okay, we, some, we have some of, uh, some of specific cases but the main criterion is the destination principle. So in B2B transactions, I mean in business to business transactions, in supplies of services in which the provider and the client are taxable persons, uh, the location or the place of supply of the service is the client place, okay? So it's basic from this perspective to settle if there is a fixed establishment or not or not, because the existence of the fixed establishment will attract the uh, supply of service location. And obviously this, this, this supply uh, will be taxed at the place of the fixed establishment of the client, I insist, of the client. The existence of a permanent establishment or a fixed establishment is basic from this perspective. The second consequence of the, existed, uh, of the existence of a uh, fixed establishment is the obligation to register and to charge VAT. If you are a foreign company, like for example, an Indian company or American company or a Japanese company doing businesses in Spain or in Italy or in Germany, and you have a fixed establishment, you will have normally to register yourself and to enter the VAT to the tax administration. You will be obliged to pass VAT on your clients and this VAT you're passing on your clients will have to be paid to the treasury, okay? Will have to be paid to the tax administration, okay? So the existence of a 
fixed establishment or a permanent establishment not only concerns the supply of services or the place of supply of services, but also the obligation to enter and to charge and to enter the tax. Okay, it's somehow is different. Uh, the last case I will speak about on the uh, ECJ case law um, deals precisely with this. And finally, the existence of a fixed establishment is related to the reform procedure. Uh, because if a foreign company has a fixed establishment in Spain or in Italy or in France, uh, this foreign company will have to charge VAT and any born VAT, any VAT paid for the acquisitions of goods and services will be recovered, will be uh, refound uh, through this normal procedure. You charge VAT and you recover VAT uh, paid on your acquisitions. If you don't have a permanent establishment or you don't have a fixed establishment, you will have you will have to go directly to the reform procedure because you don't you you will not uh, be charging VAT. And if you are not charging VAT, you will recover the VAT paid on your acquisitions through the direct procedure. So, the, so through on a special mechanism, which is the normal one for the non-established companies. Okay, so once again, the existence of a fixed establishment uh, changes everything because the foreign company uh, only has the possibility to recover VAT in European Union through this special mechanism, a special mechanism which is not applied when the foreign company has a fixed establishment in the reform member state. Okay, so the existence of a fixed establishment is not only related to the place of supply, but also, I think it's the same in India, uh, here in my Indian colleagues, is also related to the obligation to register and to pay VAT and to the procedure or to the mechanism through which you can recover VAT paid on your acquisitions on, of, of goods and services. What are the definitions uh, of the fixed establishment in the European provisions? These definitions that the member states, the European member states have to follow, where well, we have to distinguish because there is a definition for the business place and we also have a definition for the fixed establishment. The business place is defined in the implementing regulation, European Union 282, the last 11 and this business place is the place where the central administration function are concentrated okay is the place where the functions of the business central administration are carried out okay so generally this business place uh, corresponds to the place where the company is registered okay is the central place of the company okay so this uh, second paragraph which is taken more or less uh, uh, from the implementing regulation article 10 okay uh, clearly established that the, the business place is the central place is the place when the where the general management of the company is carried out okay uh the implementing regulation uh, adds that a mere postal address which could be maybe a false business place is not acceptable from this perspective. In this case, the case uh, Plans for Luxembourg, which is a judgment of uh, 2007, a Swiss company tried to uh, show as a Luxembourg company uh, only with a postal address, okay, with no one, no, 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 no other uh, productive resource. And the European Court of Justice uh, considered that this was not a real place. Uh, this was a false place. So the business place of this company uh, couldn't be uh, situated in, in, in Luxembourg, but in Switzerland. And the difference mm -hmm. is that the mechanism for the refund is different because Switzerland does not belong to European Union. Uh, Otherwise, Luxembourg is part of the European Union. So this was the planning uh, structure in that in that case. For the fixed establishment, thank you very much. Uh, we have a definition. This is the correct one. Thank you. Uh, 
We have a definition with this, uh, which is established, uh, which is uh, offered in Article 11 of the Implementing Regulation uh, 282 slash 11. This definition uh, consists in, in uh, considering a permanent or fixed establishment as any establishment other than the place of establishment of the business place, as settled in Article 10, characterized by a sufficient degree of permanence and a suitable structure in terms of human and technical resources to enable it to receive and use or to provide the concern and supply in any case, according to it, its own needs. Okay, so the fit establishment uh, requires uh, some kind of uh, special features that we will uh, come back in, in the following slide. But uh, there is a definition which is clear, and this definition offered by the Article 11 of the Implementing Regulation of the VAT Directive is a definition which is somehow clear and is a definition according to which according to which sorry some kind of requirements have to be followed uh, in order to really uh, consider that there is a, a fixed establishment the implementing regulation is specifically specifically stipulates that the existence of a VAT identification number by itself does not mean that uh, the foreign company has a fixed establishment Okay, so they are different company, uh, concepts. You can be registered without having a fixed establishment. Uh, on the contrary, if you have a fixed establishment, you will have to register. But it's not exactly the same because sometimes uh, the foreign companies have to register themselves without having a fixed establishment because they have, uh, they have to fulfill some formal regulations or formal obligations existing in the European Union that are relevant and obviously is we are dealing with different different uh, topics. What are the, uh, the if we go through this definition in the light of the European uh, case law on the fixed establishments? What are the requirements? The requirements. What are the elements of the fixed establishment? We can go to the following slide. Okay, that one. Oh, sorry. That one. Uh, in this following slide, we can see that the requirements for the existence of a fixed establishment uh, can be summarized as objective, subjective, and functional. Uh, objective uh, requirements uh, require or as the existence of a minimum consistency and some kind of permanence of the available resources, okay? For the existence of a fixed establishment, there have uh, the must exist a minimum consistency, obviously not anything can be a fixed establishment, and it is mandatory to have some kind of permanence in the member state, in Spain, in Italy, in Germany, or in the United Kingdom, or whatever. The United Kingdom does not belong anymore to the European Union, but the concepts are still the same, okay? From a subjective perspective, uh, the, per the fixed establishment needs the requires the existence of material and human resources. This is relevant because in the lack of any of these uh, aspects, there will not be any fixed establishment. In particular, the existence of the human resources uh, is basic from this perspective. In the lack of the human resources, there won't be any fixed establishment. This means, this production means, must be available, okay? What I mean is that obviously you have, you can have your own employees, and if you have your own employees in Spain, in Italy, in Croatia or wherever, there will be a fixed establishment without any doubt if they are capable to develop the corresponding transactions, but your, the human resources available to the uh, to the economic activity can be uh, third parties uh, human resources. Obviously, if you have the capability to use them when you need them, okay? If they are available, this is the main concept, something which is 
noticing to, to, to fix. And the fixed establishment has uh, to have the possibility to act with some kind of autonomy, okay? And uh, the fixed establishment has uh, mandatorily to have the possibility to really uh, operate as an, uh, 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 to really develop an economic activity, okay? The corresponding one, okay, is, 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 is not anything. Finally, from a functional perspective, the fixed establishment must be capable to provide or to receive the corresponding services in each case. This capability to provide or to receive the corresponding transactions is a basic one, okay? It's not only, the, in other words, it's not only the existence of the fixed establishment, but the participation or the capability to participate, the ability to participate uh, in the corresponding transaction. Uh, it's uh, some kind of attribution of transactions to the fixed establishment, which in terms of VAT is equally relevant. Uh, some uh, specific cases uh, coming to the European Court of Justice, uh, we have a, 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 a certain number. The first one is relevant because, firstly, because it's the first one, uh, this is a case coming from the 80s, is uh, the case of the 4th of July of 1985, and this is the first one, and it's also a relevant case because it's the first case in which the ECJ faced the concept of the fixed establishment. In this case, uh, a German company was operating uh, gaming machines on board of ships uh, sailing the high seas between Germany and Denmark. And the case was if this operation of the gaming machines uh, can be considered as a fixed establishment or not. It's basic to pay attention to the facts because the gaming machines were, were on board of the ships and but the, the employees of the company operating the gaming machines were not in the ships but visiting the ships twice a week. So there was uh, the, the structure was not that clear because the employees of the company were going to the to the to to to, to develop or to carry out the economic activity, I insist, twice a week. And in this case, the EZJ considered that there was not fixed establishment on board of the ships. Okay, so the services carried uh, carried out in this uh, when in this way what cannot be considered as deployed in the in the in the in the ships we're speaking about. Okay, the EZJ added that uh, the priority is must be given to the business place. Okay. So the attribution of transactions to the fixed establishment can be used only on specific situations because the priority has to be given to the business place or to the place in which the business activity is centralized as I was explaining a few minutes ago. Uh, the following case, which is the Faber Gelting Linien, a uh, case from the 90s, 1986, is more or less the same uh, because uh, in this uh, case only uh, confirms that the priority must be given to the business plate, to the business place, and not to the fixed establishment. Is not relevant from this perspective, or in other words, is not uh, very, very. Uh, it, 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 doesn't, it didn't add anything new in this in this regard. The following case is uh, interesting again because, okay, let's see. I'm trying to go to the following slide. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. 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 Kumar. Okay, in the following case, coming from 1997, the case DAFDS, uh, what the ECJ faced was the possibility to consider a subsidiary as a fixed establishment of a company. Okay, this is a very uh, controversial case. Okay, 
because in this case, the ACJ accepted the possibility to a subsidiary, so a different legal company, to be a fixed establishment, but taking into account that the relationships between the subsidiary and the parent company were relationships uh, that uh, went beyond the usual relationship between a parent company and a subsidiary. So the parent company in this case uh, uh, was a parent company intervening and, co and controlling the activity of the subsidiary very closely. Okay, so due to this control and due to the level of intervention of the parent company in the subsidiary, the ECJ considered that in this case, the subsidiary company was actually a fixed establishment of the parent company. And the specific activities of this group of companies deployed in the, or carried out in the United Kingdom have to be attributed to the uh, United Kingdom fixed establishment and therefore taxed in the United Kingdom. Okay, this is a very controversial case, I insist, but, uh, but as we will see in, in, in a few minutes, we, we, this conclusion was confirmed uh, by, this DJ, by the ECJ uh, last year in, two, in, two, in 2020, okay? The following case, a release, is a case, uh, also an interesting case. In this case, a uh, Dutch company, a company uh, established in the Netherlands, was renting cars to companies established in Belgium, in Germany, and in the rest of the member states of the European Union. Uh, by those years, this renting of cars uh, was located at the place of the supplier, not at the place of the client, but at the place of the supplier. And due to the number of cars um, this company had in Belgium, due to the number of clients this company had in Belgium, the Belgium tax administration uh, tried to say, well, I can consider that this company has a business presence in Belgium so uh, strong and so relevant that I will consider that there is a fixed establishment in, in Belgium due to the economic side, due to the due to the to the relevance of the economic presence of the company in in Belgium. The ECJ said no. Okay, so this economic approach cannot be accepted. Okay, so as far as this company Arolis does not have any a specific structure in Belgium. This company does not have any human resources available in Belgium. And the company only have a lot of cars rented to clients in Belgium. We have to remember that Belgium and the Netherlands are very close, extremely close countries, uh, but only a little piece of information. The ECJ said, no, this company does not have any a fixed establishment in Belgium, regardless of the relevance of the economic presence in the in this country. Okay, so the the, the renting of cars will be located in the Netherlands, not in Belgium. And well, at the end of the day, the directive was changed in order to locate these uh, supplies in the destination country. I mean, in this case, in in Belgium. But the very beginning was the reject uh, the the reaction of this uh, reasoning uh, allowing to the, to tax these transactions due to the economic uh, perspective uh, the EGJ rejected it as I was saying a few moments ago. Uh, the case the following case which is uh, I'm not capable to go to the following slide please okay thank you. And the list plan Luxembourg is the same, so we can go to the following case. And the <coughs> sorry, the following case is Daimler and Widex, in which uh, uh, the ECJ stated that even if a foreign company has a fixed establishment in a given member state, but this uh, when this fixed establishment does not intervene, uh, does not have anything to do with the transactions 
in which the foreign company is paying VAT, okay, if this is the case, the foreign company will be capable to recover VAT through the special mechanisms for the non-established companies, okay? So in somehow in this case, the ECJ confirmed that there is some kind of barrier between the taxable uh, company, uh, be, be, between the taxable activities in which the fixed establishment does not intervene in any way, okay? And the rest of the activities of the fixed establishment. In other words, uh, what the ECJ said is that the company can operate in a member state through a fixed establishment and by itself, okay? And we will have to distinguish between the activities carried out through the fixed establishment and the rest of the activities. And if the company, <coughs> sorry, if the company is uh, carrying out activities without any kind of intervention of the permanent establishment, uh, the company will have the possibility to recover VAT through the normal procedure for the non-established uh, for the non-established companies, even if that company has a subsidiary in the in the refound member state. The refund in the European Union is a huge problem due to the to the amount of money concerned in this kind of transaction. The following cases. Thank you. Uh, the case Walmart is not that uh, interesting by itself, uh, but only because the ECJ confirmed that uh, the criteria uh, established 30 years earlier, uh, please take note that this case come from 2014, and the first one, which was Berholz, uh, came from 1985. Uh, uh, in this case, in Wilmory, and uh, the ECJ confirmed the 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 the, the, the applicability of the criteria established uh, 30 years later. Okay, so is is the only relevance of this of this case. Maybe it's more interesting to go to the wealth my licenses case because this case is related to the anti-abuse uh, specific rules existing in the member states. In this case, a company uh, with uh, some kind of software uh, had a, a licensee, uh, which was another company, and the other company was uh, fully owned by the only owner uh, and partner of the first company. And this person, this physical person, was also the general manager of the second company. And obviously the first company was in a member state and the second company was in a different member state with a lower tax rate. And obviously the strategy of the company was to say, okay, am um, I supplying uh, some kind of services to final consumers? but my services are supplied from the second member state not from, not, not from the first one obviously i am paying vat in the second member state not in the first one and obviously the amount of vat i am paying is lower because i am applying the tax rate of the second member state okay i think i am explaining myself uh, properly and what the ECJ said is that firstly for the existence of a fixed establishment, there must be a minimum degree and permanence of human and material resources. And this is not that clear in this case. And secondly, the facts that the, well, the, the, the same person is the only partner of both of companies and the general manager of both of companies does not by itself or uh, by themselves uh, demonstrate or show that these companies are the same and that we we can consider these companies as our only one and therefore taxing the services in the first state in the first member state and not in the second member state okay so this is a very relevant case 
because deals not only with the location of services and with the existence of fixed establishments, but also with the uh, anti-abuse uh, specific rules and the possibility to the tax administrations to challenge the treatment given by the by the by the taxable persons by some how uh, appearing to, to to develop activities which are not that clear. Okay, a relevant case we can continue to the following slide in which not only the existence and the abuse of the of the law was uh, on the table, but only the, uh, the, the the activity in the application of the tax activity by the tax administration. In other words, how the tax administrations can show the reality of the transactions and not only on the, 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 the appearance of these transactions. In other words, the proofs which can be used in the uh, application of the tax. This is something very relevant. And the ACJ is increasingly uh, dealing with this, with this topic. Uh, we are going to the end because the, the following case I wanted to speak about is the Don John case. This case comes from the last year, 2000, um, 2000. And this is a case in which the ACJ said that firstly the existence of the subsidiary does not by itself demonstrates the existence of a fixed establishment so in this case if a korean company has a subsidiary in poland the existence of this the existence sorry of this subsidiary does not mean by itself that the korean company has a fixed establishment in Poland. So in principle, the parent company at the subsidiary has to be considered as separated companies, okay? We cannot say that because of the fact that you have, you, the, uh, the, because of the fact that you have a subsidiary, you actually, uh, you actually have a fixed establishment, okay? If they are separated, legal companies this separation has to be respected um, and therefore you cannot say okay you have a subsidiary therefore you have a fixed establishment this is not acceptable okay but nevertheless you have to go to the uh, final structure you have to pay attention not to the form but to the reality of the transactions okay so is possible to challenge the legal structure of the of the business uh, activities but if you have uh, if you want to challenge you i mean the tax administration if the tax administration wants to challenge the legal structure <coughs> of the business uh, carried out by the taxable person you have to uh, to, to to carry out uh, an activity uh, an analysis an analysis which is different and obviously you cannot deduct the existence of the fixed establishment from the mere existence of a subsidiary in the concerned member state, in, in this case, in Poland, okay? So in this case, somehow the ECJ confirmed the criteria establishing DFDS, which, are, which was the, 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 the case dealing with subsidiaries I spoke about a few minutes ago, uh, but somehow with some kind of, of evolution, which is relevant and is, 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 is necessary to, to consider. The, it, this is a relevant case because in the previous report uh, to the case, the general advocate of the European Court, uh, European Court of Justice suggested to the, to the court uh, to say that in no way a subsidiary can be considered as a fixed establishment and the ECJ rejected this approach, okay? So it's not appropriate to say automatically, you have a subsidiary, so you have a fixed establishment. This is not acceptable, but the other way around is, not, is, is neither acceptable, okay? You cannot say that in no way the existence of a separate legal person 
uh, can uh, demonstrate or can show that you have a fixed establishment. Obviously, as far as this uh, subsidiary fulfills the rest of the requirements, I was speaking a few minutes ago. So it's a relevant case and a recent case, I think is deserve, it deserves some kind of, of thought. And finally, thank you very much, Mr. Kumar. Uh, we go to the last of, of cases, which is a very recent one, is dated uh, 3 of June of uh, 2021, is uh, three weeks ago. And in this case, the EZJ uh, came to the situation of the existence of immovable properties. Uh, in this case, it was in Austria. And this case, uh, in this case, the owner of these immobile properties uh, didn't have any human resources in Austria. Okay, the management of these immobile properties was outsourced. Outsourced was subcontracted. Okay, so this foreign company has subcontracted uh, the management of the mobile properties in Austria and nevertheless the Austrian tax administration concluded that there was a fixed establishment while well, the ECJ said no there is no fixed establishment so the foreign company does not have the obligation to register and to charge VAT and um, obviously the consequence of this is that the clients as far as they are taxable persons by themselves, and they will have to apply the river charge, okay? But in terms of, uh, of tax management, it's easier because the foreign company does not have to, uh, to, to, to register and to pass VAT on, on, on its clients, okay? This case um, uh, has, this approach has uh, other consequences because if the foreign company wants to recover VAT, maybe is not that easy if, if this company has to go to the special mechanism uh, for the foreign companies but in any case this uh, judgment is very clear and the ACJ considered that in no way an immobile property with no human available resources can be considered as a, as a fixed establishment for VAT purposes, okay? So this is the, the final conclusion, and there is no point to, 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 to discuss in, in, the, in this case. And I wanted to, to, to end my presentation uh, by commenting on some specific situations. Uh, thank you. The first one is the situation for agents or representations authorized to engage in the name and on behalf of the taxpayer. Okay, these agents can be considered as a fixed establishment as far as they have some kind of relationship with the foreign company. It's worth remembering the cases of the ECJ, okay, the EFDS, and also the AeroLease case I was speaking about a few minutes ago, okay? So a foreign company with some kind of representation authorized to engage the foreign company for the mere existence of this representation will not be uh, considered as established. Only if the foreign company has some kind of control, some kind of uh, capability to really guide the, the, the way in which the agent is acting, this agent or representation will be capable to constitute a fixed establishment, not otherwise, okay? The second specific case uh, is the case of the construction, installation, installation or assembly works, uh, generally uh, given to the conclusion that there is some kind of business presence. Uh, well, this is the common point, uh, but it's not that easy. For example, in Spain, this is not European, but an Spanish approach in Spain, we have a rule according to which only if the duration of these uh, works is bigger than 12 months, this construction, installation, or assembly works can be considered as a fixed establishment, not otherwise. Okay, so this is something that maybe is worth also, also, also some kind of, of uh, reflection because it's a controversial case uh, equally. And finally, uh, 
facilities and real estate properties. Uh, this there is some kind of, of, of temptation to the tax administration to say, if you as a foreign company have some kind of premises in Spain or in Italy or in India or wherever, you have a permanent, you have a fixed establishment in this, in this country. Well, it's not the case. I only wanted to remember that the titanium case uh, says specifically that if there is no human available resources linked to this uh, fixed establishment, these premises cannot be considered as a fixed establishment. So the way to collect VAT will be to apply the uh, river charge or to go to different strategies, <coughs> but not to consider the existence the existence of a fixed establishment. Okay. Uh, my time is finished, so I I think that we are on time. And well, I insist. Thank you very much for your invitation. And well, that for anything we can, we have things some pending minutes in which we can we can discuss anything. Yes. Uh, so the presentation was very insightful, uh, Mr. Gargo. Uh, very, there are few points which have not been uh, picked by the authorities yet in India. But uh, yes, uh, as far as I understand that these uh, issues have uh, attained uh, some of sort of uh, maturity in EU VAT. So yeah, this would be a, a better thing for us in India to uh, take a reference from the EU VAT jurisprudence and take the uh, uh, applicable tax positions in this regard. So we have a few questions uh, asked by the participants. Uh, we'll discuss uh, the same and try to see if we can answer it. Uh, there is one specific question relating to EU VAT only. Uh, the question is asked by Ms. Uh, Mr. Lewis. <clears throat> He's saying, are the case laws in EU VAT applicable to the country specific or is it a union specific? No, the, this case law applies to the whole European Union. Okay, so once the ECJ says anything, the conclusion of the ECJ applies to the whole European Union. Okay, so um, I can tell you that no of the cases uh, I have I, I was speaking about uh, was a Spanish case. But nevertheless, we have to follow uh, the conclusions of the ECJ because according to the treaty, the European treaty, uh, the, the, the European institution in charge of uh, interpreting the European law is the European Court of Justice. And as far as the European provisions are mandatory to the European member states, we are obliged to the to to by, by the conclusions uh, we are uh, they are mandatory to to to, the, to all the member states no more no they are no more mandatory for the, for the united kingdom and but this is because of the brexit this is something different yeah yeah i got that so there is one specific question in context of indian gst uh, asked by mr aditya he's saying a person is registered in the state of maharashtra has entered into a contract with a customer located in Gujarat, the other state, for providing services of repair of motor vehicles, along with sale of pairs to that said customer, for which a workshop in the customer's premises in Gujarat shall be set up for a period of one year. Suppliers staff of 10 persons along with the basic machinery for repairs along with the stock of spare will be maintained at the workshop for the duration of the contract. Questions are whether the workshop in Gujarat will qualify as a fixed establishment or not. Uh, Mr. Aditya, this would in our view qualify as a fixed establishment because if you see the definition of fixed establishment, it has uh, two main components. First is that there needs to be a sufficient degree of permanence and second is there needs to be a suitable structure in terms of human and technical resources. So. Since you are, you have basically opened a workshop there. So it shows that there is some sort of presence, permanence is there. 
and second in order to execute the contract there is a adequacy of the human and technical resources as you said in your query that supplier staff would be there machinery would be there and stock of spares would be there so in our view it seems that this place would qualify as a fixed establishment and accordingly you will have to comply with the requirements of the gst law the second question he has asked uh, whether the taxpayer is required to take a registration yes you have to take the registration and accordingly would require to charge gst from that place money the another question is if a holding company incorporated a subsidiary in india and receiving royalty for brand name or license fees then whether it would be treated as fe and holding company has to take registration or can a subsidiary company pay an igst under rca see holding company is not having any presence in india right uh, if it has not if if it does not have any presence in india and there is no question of taking registration in india and to uh, discharge gst liability in india in this case the indian company the uh, subsidiary company in india who is receiving the services from the parent company would be liable to pay gst subject to the point that other conditions relating to liability is getting satisfied right another question is how the concept of fixed establishment is related with the concept of permanent establishment in income tax i think we have to arrange an another uh, webinar the gst with income tax then we would be able to answer this so i think i'm not the perfect guy to answer it yeah we'll see if uh, our dt team can answer this question and we'll send you uh the reply over mail we'll see it the another question is whether a foreign company providing assets on lease to an indian company and that indian company is getting revenue from the use of the machinery can it be treated as a fixed establishment again uh, it would not qualify as a fixed establishment for the reason that there is no uh, presence of the foreign country in india be it in human tech uh, in terms of human and technical resources or you, even you can just see the first criteria of the definition that there needs to be a sufficient degree of permanence so none of the condition is getting satisfied in this case so in our view uh, we believe that uh, it would not require any registration in that case so yes uh, there are few other queries which are very basic i think uh, we can uh, close this session here only uh thanks you uh, thanks to all of you and thanks to mr biardo for sharing the uh, information about the fixed establishment from eu vat context and uh, that this uh thanks to all of you uh, for joining thank you thanks a lot the presentation we will mail you over the the presentation copy we will mail you uh, the mail id which you have shared uh, while registering for this webinar thank you